Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm going to start by telling you a little story, an allegory, if you will. Once upon a time, there was a young discipline named psychology. Psychology embraced a non-binary gender identity, and so their pronouns were they and them. So they lived alone in a high tower on a hill overlooking a busy and bustling city. From their lofty vantage point, they could observe a great many things about the city's population. Psychology watched the denizens of that city go about their daily lives. They became quite focused on trying to understand why these people behaved the way they did and developed quite a few theories. Some of those theories were dismissed with the accrual of additional evidence, while other theories held up over time. Psychology was quite thrilled. I should share this with others, they thought. They started writing down their findings on sheets of paper, folding them into paper planes, and flying them out into the city. That got some response. They designed a bullhorn and started to broadcast their findings. That also got some response. But psychology was not entirely satisfied. Looking around, they noticed other towers on neighboring hills. These were filled with other disciplines, scholars like themselves trying to understand human behavior. Some of these towers had complex communications arrays set up to share their findings with the city. Some of them led directly to government offices. Some of the towers had people coming in and out of their front doors, carrying packages back and forth to the city. Psychology decided they wanted to get in on this action. Surely there would be much to learn as well as much to share with these other disciplines. So they packed a small bag with some of their most tried and tested theories and set out on a journey. The symposium is a story of a part of that journey. It takes place in two parts. The first part, which I will introduce now, is called Psychology Meets Economics. The second part, which Sam Summers will introduce, is called Psychology Meets Law, where Lisa Cavanaugh, a public defender for the Innocence Program, and Fred Clay, exonerated after 38 years in prison, will share their insights. Beyond that, there are no doubt many other chapters, which perhaps you may be the ones writing. So starting with the first chapter. In Psychology Meets Economics, we have a social psychologist, Laura Babbitt, join the lab of an economist, Drusilla Brown. This lab, the Tufts Labor Lab, studies the causes, consequences, and cures for harsh working conditions in factories around the world. And when I say around the world, I mean Bangladesh, Cambodia, El Salvador, Haiti, Honduras, India, Indonesia, Jordan, Lesotho, Nepal, Nicaragua, Myanmar, the United Kingdom, and Vietnam. The clothes you're wearing right now may have been made by one of the factories affected by their research. The labor lab works to test interventions to improve structural conditions and worker well-being, and to address issues like verbal abuse, sexual harassment, se uh, human trafficking, and forced labor. And they do it all using randomized controlled trials. I've asked our speakers today, all of them, to not only share their stories of triumph, but also their tales of struggle in this journey to step outside of our disciplinary comfort zones and have a broader impact. A big part of the focus of the symposium is to consider what we as psychologists can do better. So I hope that you will leave the session inspired, but also challenged. So please join me in welcoming Laura Babbitt and Drusilla Brown to share their experience today for part one. Thank you, Nagin. Can you all hear well? OK. Um, so I'm going to start by giving a little bit of background, or how do I fit into this equation? Um, so in 2012, I was finishing my PhD, and I met Drusilla Brown. Um, we started collaborating, and before long, I was sitting in on her undergrad thesis seminar. So I was watching all these very talented economics undergrads 
um, as they talked about, you know, the problem of factory working conditions, why are abusive working conditions happening, why are they tolerated, and they were coming up with equations that looked like this, equations that I did not understand. Um, and I didn't even understand the approach that led to this equation. It seemed like Drusilla and her students were doing a lot of really serious math, but there weren't any numbers, or at least not enough numbers to make sense to me. Um, so I was completely confused about what was going on. It may be obvious at this point that I had never taken an econ class, um, but then something interesting happened. Um, Drusilla and her students started taking the social psychology concepts that I was introducing. I would give a little presentation, explain what I thought was relevant, talk about some studies, and they could sort of take that and sort of neatly fit it into these economics equations. So for example, uh, this equation shows, I'm going to oversimplify this, Drusilla, this equation shows how much sexual harassment a factory manager will tolerate in the factory. And that part right there represents social norms about sexual harassment. So that was my, one of my social psychology contributions to this economic framework. Um, and so on the one hand, I had this experience, this was my, my tale of struggles, Nagin said, where I felt like I was in completely over my head. I had no idea what they were talking about, how they were coming to conclusions about what factors were leading to abusive working conditions without any actual data. That didn't make any sense to me. But on the other hand, I had this opportunity to collaborate with a brilliant economist who, like me, wanted to make the world a better place, um, and who, despite having a well-established research program, several years' experience of doing research in factories around the world, um, she was completely open to hearing brand new ideas to her from social psychology. So I'm going to turn it over to Drusilla now to talk about why our approaches were so different and how we learned to work together and bridge the gap. Uh, so thank you, Laura. Um, so not only did, has Laura never had a class in economics or calculus, I just found out this morning, uh, I had never had a class in psychology. It was an alien world to me. And um, so in, uh, we, we just spent a lot of time talking, talking, talking about first what we thought was important about the problem we were trying to solve, how do our respective disciplines think about those things, and much to my surprise, even as we've been sort of working on this presentation, we've uncovered even more ways in which we do and do not understand each other. <laughs> um, but it's a work in progress, and it's been the most important intellectual thing I've done in my life, so I'm very excited about it. Um, and, so here's the story. Um, we thought that it might be useful for you to understand where economists come from uh, and how that's different from the way psychologists think about the world. Um, I'm not telling you anything you don't know that psychology or social psychology in particular emerges out of the Holocaust with a huge focus in on discovering, learning about the world through, through these lab experiments. Um, and that the, what you're focused in on is, is what it is that makes people decide to be good or not good. Um, and then what you, the way your analytical framework, as I understand it as an economist, is that people have goals and then those goals are, and the pursuit of those goals is affected by uh, their perceptions of, of norms and mindset and all kinds of things like that, uh, which are not really alien, they're basically alien to economists as ideas. Economics really, in contrast, really emerges out of the, um, uh, out of the middle of the, of the 18th century. Um, so this is the, and it, and it is initially a subfield of philosophy. And because it's a subfield of philosophy, it's very heavily a, um, a theory-driven discipline. And it really doesn't become a science in the sense of using data for 100 years. We don't see, we don't see data as a part of the way economists work until the, about the middle of the 19th century. But the, the important intellectual context in which uh, economics emerges is the age of the Enlightenment. And as you all know from high school, the Enlightenment was all about how do we take power away from uh, kings and popes and put it in the hands of regular people, individuals. So the political philosophers were talking about the value of, of individual freedom. What economists were trying to answer is the question, well, is, intellectual, is individual freedom feasible? Um, so the, so the, sort of what's in the DNA of an economist is this idea of freedom, where in contrast to 
uh, so social psychologists, your DNA really has more to do with, with justice and, and goodness. Um, for us, we're, we're seated in philosophy, and you guys are seated in data. Now, what economists, what, what is considered one of the most important ideas in all of human knowledge um, is the idea of the invisible hand. And essentially what Adam Smith is going to come up with in, in the idea of the invisible hand is that when individuals pursue their own individual interests as they understand them, there's a sense in which they are individually acting in concert to produce a socially optimal outcome. And, so, and this is really where the legitimacy of freedom emerges, is that if you can get individuals behaving in their own self-interest, that you can get a socially optimal outcome, that would be a very powerful statement. Now, what's important here is that economists from the get-go understand that there are problems with this idea. And the one that Laura and I agreed on is this idea that there's nothing about the market and the way markets, with the way actors come together in markets, that produce just outcomes. Uh, we call it, the word in economics is called um, equity. Uh, but, um, but there's an, and so Laura and I could agree that a, that a workplace uh, that's a sweatshop, it, it would be very inequitable. That is, you might have a situation where a worker is verbally abused, sexually harassed, and doesn't re earn a living wage, where the factory manager is, is making money hand over fist, and that's inequitable, and it can easily come out of a market, and we might consider it not a socially desirable outcome. But there was another part of the story that turned out to be, that's really important to economists, which is kind of a, a new way of thinking for the psychologist, but it turned out is, it, it, it turns out to be a core problem for in, in the way economists think about what's going on in these factories that was solved by social psychology without the social psychologists even knowing that it was a problem. Um, and it was a really a giant, it was a giant, and this is kind of what we really want to build to here to understand, is that economists have not only thinking markets can go wrong because they produce really unfair outcomes or really unjust outcomes, they can go wrong because they produce inefficient outcomes. And when we talk about inefficiency, what we mean is that we think about economies as bringing a bunch of inputs, whether it's labor or capital or electricity or energy or plastic, and bringing it in together to produce stuff that, that generates well-being for people. And we think, we think that we have a case of economic inefficiency when it would be possible to rejigger things a little bit in a way that makes everybody's well-being go up. And so if you've got a situation where I can make everybody better off without making anybody worse off, then we must be doing something wrong. And in the, con in the contest, the example here that we want to talk about is a situation where, uh, where there's this long history, centuries, maybe even millennia long, where the, the, the primary motivational technique um, of managers over workers is, is either to scream at them or beat them. Um, so but the problem is that we have now evidence that this way of this negative um, motivational technique of verbal abuse or, or physical abuse actually makes the worker less productive rather than more productive. So what you've got is clearly a situation where the factory manager is engaging in a behavior that's clearly making the worker worse off because she's being verbally abused or physically abused. It's making the factory worse off because they're actually generating less output. So if we could get them to switch from a, from a negative motivational technique to a positive motivational technique, we could realize this efficiency gain that economists really prize above almost everything. So what happened? Well, the first thing is we had a lot of things, um, some, some of them funny, some of them not so funny, things happen. <laughs> um, three kinds of miscommunication that I'd like to talk about. Uh, the first was um, sometimes when I, one time in particular, when I was just careless in the way I talked, Remember, I mentioned that economists um, at the get-go, our sort of point of departure is that, um, that, that you can have situations where when a person does something in their own best interest, it produces a socially optimal outcome. And so one day I referred to optimal sexual harassment. <laughs> and Laura, she looked at me, she's a very calm person. Uh, <laughs> she doesn't show a lot of, um, I've never seen her be angry. Uh, <laughs> um, but with, with as much dignity and dignity as she possibly could imagine, she, she just had this look on her face that was, it was like, I don't think I can work with you. Uh, I don't think I even like you. And, and she didn't really even talk to me for two weeks after that. <laughs> um, fortunately, Nagin stepped in and got us back on track. Um, and that was, a, that was a fortuitous uh, other social psychologist who saved this project. Um, the second occurred when we discovered we were talking about the same thing. We just had different words for it. Um, so, for example, uh, social psychologists use this term outcome dependence. 
for economists and political science, the word is aligned incentives. It's the same idea. Um, I even ran regressions where I put, um, I would put outcome dependence in the regression and it's statistically significant. I would put aligned incentives in the regression and it would be statistically significant. I would put, put both of them in the regression and neither one of them was statistically significant, which basically tells us that the same idea. Um, the, and then, but the most important um, and, uh, and interesting uh, experience for me was when it turned out that we had the same word for two for fundamentally different ideas. And so one day, uh, Laura, we were, we were talking and Laura was teaching me about social psychology and she put this picture up on the, on the, on the board and I instinctively just recoiled from it. Um, now, you, for her, she, she thought this was an, in, in, an innocent picture of mechanistic dehumanization. For me, it connoted Karl Marx and Das Kapital and, um, and, a, and a very uh, a dead theory that actually produced um, a, 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 a century of, of violent conflict and hundreds of millions of deaths. So I guess that's my feeling. <laughs> um, the problem is that Karl Marx saw power as arising from who owned the means of production. Economists saw power as when one person can affect the constraints that another person faces in their choices. And what we believed is that if you could make markets perfectly competitive, then it eliminates the ability of one person to actually affect the choices of another person. And once you do that, power is no longer even relevant. Well, it turns out what Laura was talking about was power mindset, uh, which is an entirely different idea altogether. Um, and, and essentially what she then had to do is convince me or explain to me or get me to understand this power mindset thing. Because as an economist, power is something that, that emerges from, from something real that you have that you can use to exercise power over somebody else's choices. But for, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, it, the idea that power could be something that I have in my head about my ability to affect you and that you have that same idea in your head and that makes it possible for me to affect you, but that something could come up and, and basically make me stop thinking I'm powerful or get you to stop thinking I'm powerful, that this thing in your head that could somehow be affecting market outcomes, that was crazy to me. Um, and, 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 so the, and so then it became a problem of getting Laura to teach me, well, what is this power mindset thing? What is this whole thing about mindset altogether? Um, Another area where we, um, where you might think would be a, a fatal problem is this assumption of rationality that economists make. But um, I'll tell you that, that, the, that this is another example where this word to us means something very different than it means to anybody else. And uh, you might think that who could possibly work with an economist because we assume rationality, but in fact it literally never came up um, because what we think of as rationality is very different than what anybody else in the world thinks about as rationality. It really only is an assumption that allows us to use calculus, that's it. Um, now, how did we bridge the gap? Well, <laughs> we haven't entirely. <laughs> um, Laura, she'll tell you more about what she thinks about profit maximizing sexual harassment. Um, I'm not sure where we are on that yet. She has a paper sitting in her inbox that she needs to take a look at and then we'll find out. <laughs> um, the, um, but one of the things that really be, became clear to me is that economists, when we study, uh, when we study injustice or we study inefficiency, um, the kinds of things that we think that generate inefficiency or poor or, or un inequitable outcomes go way beyond what the, um, the range of, of theories that economists have generated that might ex explain a, a failure of efficiency or a failure of equity. And that, that what the kinds of ideas that social psychologists bring to the table had a huge impact on my perception of what possibly could go wrong in a market. And once you have a wide um, perception of what could go on in a market, that dramatically changes what you think you need to do to fix it. Um, the, the second is that um, Laura was really able to use these randomized controlled lab um, experiments that, that psychologists uh, love to use. Um, and she really convinced me of, the, of many of the ideas that she thought were important that I now know are in fact important in market outcomes. Um, and then once, once I had understood her idea or her range of ideas or her range of ways of thinking about the phenomena that we study, it was very easy for me to take my framework of how I think people make decisions and simply bring them in as parameters in the, in the theoretical architecture. Um, so, um, Laura, you want to make some comments too. Okay, I'm going to hop back up here to give my perspective on how we were 
how we were bridging the gap and learning from each other. Um, as Drusilla said, I was not at all comfortable with the idea that there was an optimal level of sexual harassment unless that was zero. That seemed non-negotiable to me and just sort of a weird way of talking about it. Also profit maximizing sexual harassment. I don't even like saying that out loud. Um, but at the same time, as social psychologists, we really value um, and appreciate the, value, the power of the situation. And it turns out economists do too, or at least Drusilla does. Um, and Drusilla was really able to teach me a lot about aspects of the situation, in particular in this work we were doing in factories that never would have occurred to me. Um, so for example, how many factories are near the workers' factory? Um, I wouldn't have thought to ask that, but of course, if there are lots of factories in one little area, a worker has options. Um, and the structure of production bonuses, this is, never even crossed my mind, but it turns out that the way production bonuses are structured can determine whether there's sexual harassment or verbal abuse in a factory. Um, and again, a situational factor that I wouldn't have even thought to, to look at. Um, and I'm just going to tell you briefly about some of the studies that I talked to Drusilla about. These are not my studies, they were just, they seemed like good examples of the, the concepts I was trying to convey. Um, and we came up with shorthand for all of them. So the FAN experiment, you may be familiar with, the idea that um, participants who were randomly assigned to a high power mindset were more likely to move or turn off an annoying FAN. Um, and this was sort of introducing Drusilla to the concept that power, you know, the participants were coming into the lab with, you know, essentially equal power, and it's just by turning on the high power mindset that we affect their behavior. The cookie experiment, this one, did I pick it just for the picture? Maybe. Um, but this was participants who were randomly assigned to a high power role were more likely to eat more cookies and behave less politely. Um, Drusilla says that this resonates with her personally, but we haven't really gone into the details of how. <laughs> yes, we have. <laughs> Um, and then I'm going to skip this one for now. The broccoli fMRI experiment. Um, this one was looking at how dehumanization, uh, what dehumanization looks like in the brain, how certain people who are dehumanized are processed differently, and how just imagining what kind of vegetables that dehumanized person likes can change that process. Um, and Drusilla admits that, like many people, she was captivated by the colors on the brain and that that was very convincing, um, fair enough. <laughs> and so I'll go back to this one. This is a shock study that's sort of similar to the Milgram study um, with a little twist. In this study, you still had participants who were assigned to be supervisors and they had subordinates who were supposedly getting shocks for poor, um, poor, for poor performance. Um, the dysfunctional condition in the study is what really got Drusilla's attention because it apparently shed light on this huge question in economics that had not yet been answered. Um, essentially, participants um, were instructed to give shocks for incorrect answers from their subordinates, and of course, there, there's no one actually getting shocked in these studies, you know that. Um, and in this functional condition, when the participants, when the subordinates got a shock, they were less likely to perform well on the next trial. So shocks were not helping them, it was actually hurting them. And in the condition where the subordinates had been dehumanized, the participants, instead of noticing that the shocks weren't helping, they actually escalated the punishment. So they were not able to process the fact that shocks were not leading to good performance, um, and it just, it just got worse. And so there was, there seemed to be this clear connection to factories because, you know, if, if supervisors are verbally abusing workers and they're not becoming more productive, if the workers have already been dehumanized, then maybe this is sort of what's happening. Um, do we, should I turn it over to you now? Sure. Okay. I should, I should tell you that this, um, what really lies behind this experiment and why it was so important is that uh, this is the, this basically, this picture answers what is really the holy grail in this literature. And it's, this is not just economics, this is political science, human resource management, the management literature. There's a lot of people in a lot of disciplines who really want to understand 
why it is that abusive conditions of work persist in factories, even when it's clearly evident that it's making them less productive. And in fact, we, if you go back 200 years, what you'll find is at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, they were both um, humanely run factories and abusively run factories. And they coincided, they, they survived for centuries. And so what that tells us is that humane workplaces can compete with uh, with abusive conditions of work. So why are factory managers persisting in using these abusive conditions when there's evidence right in front of them that, that, uh, that abuse is actually making their workplaces less productive? It's a giant question, and Laura's picture, when she showed me this, I, this was my moment of falling off my chair because I'm like, that's it, that is the explanation. Dehumanized workers, when you see workers in dehumanized terms, you don't rationally process information about the relationship between abuse and performance. And this is the efficiency story that's so absolutely essential to, to the way economists think about the world. It was also really important because we had a number of factory, every single time we um, wanted to do, a, uh, do an intervention, the, the funder um, and the interested parties, the stakeholders would always come back to us and say, you have to come up with a business case. You have to prove that this intervention is gonna make the firm perform better. And every single time we showed firms the business case for treating workers humanely, it made no difference. They weren't persuaded by the business case. Why? Because they weren't see workers in dehumanized terms. They don't see the evidence. No matter how much evidence we, we generated that humanely treating workers makes workplaces better places for everybody, the win-win-win of humane um, motivational techniques, they couldn't see it because of the dehumanization, which is why sort of turning the dehumanization back and, and, and improving uh, information processing has become a central part of what it is that we're trying to do now. So um, just, it turns out, I think we kind of highlighted, you know, what it was that I was able to do to reconcile myself to the way social psychologists think about the world. So if you think about verbal abuse, for example, economists would say, well, um, the, the decision to verbally abuse your worker is, is coming about because the supervisor is trying to get a lot of productivity out of her. Um, and things that verbally abusing workers will do two things. One, it is, one is that it will, um, uh, that it will sort of make her more productive, and the second is it might make her more docile. That economists and, so and sociologists had gotten that far. But what was really important is that, that Laura, when she taught me about, uh, about what verbal abuse might do to uh, mindset or locus of control or self-efficacy, um, I, I, I realized that what she was telling me is that verbal abuse affects a worker's perception of her constraints and it affects the supervisor's perception of his constraints. So this is a case where something intangible that economists don't even know exists is actually moving that constraint around and it became very easy to put it into the math um, of the problem. Uh, just a couple of challenges. One is that we sort of are both, um, <laughs> since we live in this world that's not really, neither economists nor social psychologists are very comfortable with, uh, getting published has been a challenge, but Nagin has been a pretty important mediator in that uh, uh, process. Um, so it turns out that when these ideas come from Nagin, the world says, oh, then they must be good ideas. <laughs> uh, don't know, I don't, you'll have to teach us what it is that you do. <laughs> um, so we've decided just to put her, she's the lead author on every single paper we write and bing. <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, but the second, the second point I think is that what we find is that we are every, almost every day, every single big player in the market that has trouble with the reputation because of bad working conditions in their workplaces, they are on our doorstep saying, help us figure out how to solve this problem. Um, so even if academics don't care about what we have to say, um, or in the Gein, we, uh, the, uh, the world does. The people who actually, whose lives are affected by this kind of work and these kinds of ideas are, um, are, very, uh, are very anxious to, to get more. Um, uh, there's also, I think, a big um, piece of what our disciplines can learn from each other. Um, there was certainly the case of, you know, there was no question that randomized control trials were very persuasive to me. Um, I, they were very powerful in, in getting me to understand uh, what these ideas are in very clean, clear, crisp, believable, compelling uh, ways. But it's important, I think, in, in the history of ideas that there are, a lot of, there are a lot of ideas, particularly in biology, that you could, that also you can only understand if you understand them in the context of a, of a randomized control trial. But there are a lot of ideas that one would never, ever, ever been able to understand in using that methodology. And the theory of relativity is the one. Uh, the, relativity looks a lot like economics in the way Einstein proceeded. He's got this giant, unbelievably complicated, and impossible to understand theoretical apparatus and one data point. 
um, which is a very different world. And that's the world that I come from as an economist, is a lot of theoretical machinery and, 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 and imperfect data. Um, and so I will say just one last thing, is that economists have, have developed a lot of strategies and empirical strategies for achieving identification, that is figuring out what the causal chain is. Uh, to try to get at a, um, at a to understand what the what the what the sequence of of, um, of events was that produced a particular outcome, uh, we call it exogenous variation, and there are ways there there are ways of doing it even with very messy data. Uh, so I think there might be some that certainly uh, economics has a lot to learn from psychologists in terms of what really affects the, the ability of, of people to just make decisions, um, but economists have have invested an enormous amount of intellectual effort in understanding how to work with messy data in a way that establishes causality, not simply correlations of, of variables. Do you want to say one more last thing? No? Okay. <laughs> I think we're in time. We, we've come in under our constraints. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to uh, offer a couple of questions to you, and then we're going to hand it over to Sam. So uh, for Drusilla and Laura, how do you recommend people initiate a cross-disciplinary collaboration like yours? Do we bridge that gap between disciplines in terms of simply initiating conversations and making first connections? Well, I can tell you how I did it. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, was at, uh, I was director of the International Relations Program at Tufts University, and in the, co in the course of being director, I came in contact, because it's an, it's an interdisciplinary program, I came in contact with a lot of different people from a lot of different disciplines, and one of the people that I stumbled upon, um, and again, this is, has to be one of my best moments in my entire life as a uh, economist, was I met Sam Summers. Um, and what happened, I think, is that the, the best way to get started is agreeing on a question, not a, agr agreeing on an area of, of common interest. So Laura and I were both concerned about conditions of work and abuse in factories. Um, and so when you, when you agree on a, a goal, which is, which is trying to improve conditions of work, there's an issue you're trying to solve you then realize pretty quickly that there are people you need to reach out to who have skills and knowledge that you don't have. And so um, I had met Sam um, as, because I was director. I had learned about his research. And so when I knew that I needed to reach out, I reached out to him and I said, do you want to work on this? And he said, well, I don't really have time, but I got this really great graduate student. Um, and that's how we got started. Um, and, and that's what I would recommend is coalescing around an issue that you think is important, um, and then deciding that you need to know more than your own discipline in order to solve that problem. So the other question is, uh, what do you think are some of the major challenges when collaborating across disciplines and the major benefits? If there's anything else you would like to add. I, th I think a major benefit is like Drusilla was saying, when you when you meet someone who has the skills and the perspective that you don't have. Um, you know, there are, and I think a challenge is not getting hung up on the miscommunications when fundamentally you have a lot to learn from each other. Um, so there are, you know, a difference in perspective can mean that one person says optimal sexual harassment and the other person recoils, but if you look deeper than that, there are, there's a lot to learn. Do you wanna add anything, Drusilla? Well, I will say that you, you know you, if you're if you're not coming up as a graduate student from the get go, with questions about your discipline. So when I was uh, when I was a graduate student, um, I I had an, um, an anthropology um, a, room, a roommate who was a, working on her PhD in anthropology, and she left a book around called Broca's Brain, and since I didn't have anything to do one Saturday afternoon, I picked it up and I read it. And all of a sudden I realized that all of this really deep biology and, 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 and evolution of the brain was fundamentally inconsistent with the way economists think about the world. And I knew at that moment that there was something about the way economics was that I was gonna need to figure out sometime in my life. And I knew that it wasn't gonna be, and I guess I knew at some level that I wasn't gonna find it in economics. Um, and so even though I became a very good 
well-trained, strictly neoclassical economics for you know economists for about 20 years, there were still these little things in the back of my brain that were basically saying, there's got to be more than the way economists think about the, brain, the way brains work. And so when I met Laura, she really opened up a whole world for me of saying, oh, that's that's the answer. That's the answer to the question that's been hanging in my brain for 20 years, uh, 30 years. Well, I guess that's now almost 40 years. Um, <laughs> um, so you should be coming out of graduate school with ideas, with with questions that you think your discipline can't answer. And somewhere, sometimes, somewhere, you're going to run into the person who, un, who, who coming from a different disciplinary perspective, can give you the answers to these really deep questions about the way humans behave. And I'll just add quickly that I think economics has such a valuable toolbox of methodology um, that it seemed like that psychologists were sort of, um, you know, we do a lot of really tightly controlled lab experiments where you put together a five study package and you make sure you have a mechanism and it's all very polished. And it seemed like economists were sort of out there in the world running messy experiments where they're still, they're still figuring out how to establish causality when you can't control everything. Um, and I thought that was really valuable. So I sort of wanted to get in on that action. Thank you. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Sam. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sam Summers. It's my pleasure to introduce the second half of our, our session here, our symposium today. Um, this, uh, in, in our field, as in much of psychology, I think we spend a lot of time talking about the distinction between basic and applied psychology. Um, this is something that I remember hearing a lot about uh, as a graduate student entering the field and, and, and since uh, I have entered the field. Um, I think that that rigid dichotomy that we put between uh, the categories of both basic quote unquote mainstream personality and social psychology and applied research that has very real connection to the real world in which we all live is uh, a, a greatly uh, exaggerated and unfortunate dichotomy that we, that we put in place. What you're going to be hearing about in the second half of this session uh, is the intersection of psychology and law. And that's a very um, timely intersection to be discussing for many reasons. It was actually the, the subject of the SPSB Legacy Symposium that we had this year to honor Phoebe Ellsworth, uh, who's in the audience, and, and her uh, work over uh, many years in this area. Um, if you are a researcher who, like we all are, is savvy and sophisticated with regard to methodology and design and, and understands how to tackle a problem in a controlled and uh, scientific manner, then there is a space for you in this intersection of psychology and law. There is no shortage of questions that need our attention as, as behavioral scientists, as psychological scientists. Whether we're talking about limitations of eyewitness memory, whether we're talking about uh, racial biases and other biases that influence decision making that happens at the level of a jury, at the level of a prosecutor's decision to charge in a case, uh, in the process of jury selection, whether we are talking about the psychological uh, effects, consequences of uh, our current system of incarceration, solitary confinement, and so forth. Again, there's no shortage of questions that deserve and in fact uh, demand our attention as, as, as psychologists of all different uh, walks and, and subfields. It is my pleasure to introduce today uh, Lisa Cavanaugh and Fred Clay, who are going to share with us um, specific details of one very, very personal and, and very uh, sobering, but also very inspiring story of the ways in which psychology can play at least uh, a part of a role in uh, a, the very important question of, of post-conviction review and, and, it, and mi mistaken conviction, um, DNA exoneration, and, and, and so forth. Uh, issues I think we've all read about, many of us have read and heard about, but we're going to hear from, from Lisa and Fred uh, about Fred's case in particular. And so uh, Lisa Cavanaugh is the director of the Innocence Program in Massachusetts. Um, she is going to take the, the podium next and talk to us about uh, the case of Fred Clay. And Fred is here joining uh, us as well today, uh, and we'll be able to talk about um, his case of mistaken conviction, um, 38 years spent uh, behind bars, uh, the roles that psychology played, perhaps unfortunately, in the processes that led to his conviction for a crime he did not commit, um, talking about the psychological impacts of 
um, experiencing that, going through something like that, and then re-entry into, into society. And then also the role that psychological science did play, and it did play a part uh, of a role in the process of um, uh, the, the legal fight uh, to have uh, Fred's case his conviction overturned and, and, and Fred exonerated and freed. So it, it's uh, with great pleasure that I introduce to you two people who I hope will uh, we'll learn a lot from today uh, in, in terms of, again, the, that, that the role that psychology can play in the legal system and in the real world scenarios that, that many of us care about and, and should care about. And so I'm gonna turn things over now to, to Lisa Cavanaugh. Thank you, Sam, and thank you all for, for, uh, for having us. Um, so I'm going to ask you to keep three dates in mind. November 16th, 1979, October 24th, 1979, and August 8th, 2017. The first date, November 16th, 1979, at about four in the morning, a man named Richard Dwyer, um, who was a taxi driver, was sitting in his cab in what's called the combat zone in, uh, in, in an area of Boston. Um, there was another cab that was parked directly behind him, and Mr. Dwyer saw three black figures, probably males, approaching. Um, he waved them on, and so they got into the cab behind him. He would later describe these three people as two mutts and a Jeff, which I had to look up. It was a reference to a comic, uh, but two very tall men and what, one much shorter. Um, the, the three men got into the cab and the cab drove away. About 15 minutes later, um, that same cab uh, that had taken those three fares arrived at a, a, a housing development in Archdale, uh, Archdale Housing Development in Roslindale, Massachusetts, where Two people, Neil Sweat and his friend Ben Brown, were getting ready to go to work. Uh, their, Neil's mother was up making coffee, and she heard a noise outside of her window. They lived on the second floor of a three-story building. She called her son and his friend over to the window, and they looked out to see uh, three males pulling a cab driver out of the cab. Um, she described one being much shorter, and fishing through the pockets of the cab driver before um, shooting him five times and running away. The whole scene that unfolded in front of them took seconds. It was pitch dark. Uh, it was uh, later measured and found to be 74 feet from a second story window. And there was a, a dumpster. Um, the only description, not surprisingly, uh, that one of the people, the, the mother, was able to give was that, again, two very tall and one much shorter man, all of them wearing black leather jackets and the shooter holding the gun in his left hand. At 9 a.m. on that same day, November 16, 1979, Fred Clay had an appointment with his probation officer and he went into his probation uh, appointment having no idea that he would become uh, a, 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 a part of this story. He had been at his foster mother's house the night before, all night, as several witnesses would attest. He didn't own a black leather jacket, and he was right-handed. October 24th, 1979, that's the day that Fred Clay turned 16. He'd been 16 for two weeks when he went into the probation department, and he was not free again until August 8, 2017, when he was 54 years old. So what I wanted to, Fred and I wanted to share with, with all of you today um, is kind of an, a, a two-act story. Um, and part of it is how psychology did, in fact, play a role in, uh, in contributing to Fred's wrongful conviction. Um, and there are a couple of different ways to understand how that happened um, that I'll tell you about. Um, and then another part of it is how psychology played a role in the treatment of Fred, his experience in the court system and in the prison system and after getting out. Um, and so I wanna try to, to touch on 
how, um, how psychology, how, how the research, and also how experts um, played a role in both of those facets of Fred's experience. Um, the way that I got started and first connected with these issues was actually um, talking to Sam Summers. <laughs> um, because when I first learned about Fred's case and read about it, um, one of the things that immediately jumped out to me reading about how Fred was mistakenly identified was the fact that, um, as many of you are probably familiar with, there's these ideas of system and estimator variables that researchers study, like researchers like Sam Summers have studied. And um, you know, so the, the kind of system uh, the, the estimator variables included all the things I've already told you about, right? The, the, the darkness, the quick pace of the events that the eyewitnesses saw, the fact that it was dark, the fact that there was a gun present. This was also a cross-racial identification. The system variables that came into play um, are actually among the most extreme I've ever seen um, because one of the things that happened is that uh, Fred was uh, arrested and prosecuted, and the case was investigated at a time when something called investigative hypnosis had come into fashion. And so there was this period of time, which in most parts of the country is still in the past, um, although it, it is occasionally used even now. But there was a period of time where uh, police departments would actually invite in uh, someone who was a hypnotist, and that person would put witnesses under hypnosis and um, do so in an effort to enhance their memory. So that's what happened in Fred's case. Uh, that that uh, cab driver who saw three men getting into the cab, he, was, he came into the station after learning about the shooting, and he could not make an identification. He was shown a group of photographs. Fred's photograph was in that set because he was one of many young black men who the police knew had some connection to the Archdale housing project. So he was essentially in there um, you know, by accident. And, um, and then the police, uh, after he was unable to make an identification, they placed him under hypnosis. And they told him, you're gonna be able to watch the events again like you're watching a movie. And you can actually freeze and zoom in on the faces of the people who you saw. Um, the jury would later be told by the expert who endorsed this method that human memory works like a video camera. They were literally told that. The second way that, um, that research, um, you know, sort of the, the, the field that, um, that Sam has focused on, um, at least as it intersects with my work, uh, came into play with the second eyewitness, with, with Neil Sweat. Um, Neil and his mother were interviewed on the night of this uh, early morning hours when this happened, unable to make a, a you know, give a description. Um, after Mr. Dwyer identified um, Mr. Clay and his co-defendant, James Watson, um, uh, thanks to hypnosis, um, not only did, they, did he make selections, but he felt quite confident of those uh, selections. Um, they took that same set of arrays and they showed it to Mr. Sweat and they showed it to him again and again, because the first three times that they showed it to him, he said, I don't know, I can't pick anyone out. And they told him, we know who did it, we just need you to give us the information. What finally did it for him was that they also said to him, if you tell us who did it, we will pay to have your family relocated to another housing development, which as it turns out was something that, that Mr. Sweat cared deeply about. And it was only then that Mr. Sweat did, in fact, identify Fred Clay. So the kind of, you know, two, two uh, by the time the trial took place, those were the two um, ways in which science um, had been brought to bear um, in, well, I should say, the hypnosis was actually the centerpiece of the trial. So um, the defense attempted to challenge this field and actually called one of the leading experts who was a critic of this discipline. Um, and I, I wanna turn it to Fred for a minute because he lived through that trial and he lived through the kind of battle of experts that took place. I think for me looking at it as an advocate, part of what I saw um, and one of the tensions that I think exists between law and psychology is that uh, the court system is an especially bad place for forensic or scientific um, 
uh, debates to play out because those debates have very real human consequences. Um, and so, you know, in many ways, Fred was a direct victim of what was then still an active debate and didn't get resolved for several years after his trial. So, Fred, I just want to, I guess I want to ask you a little bit about what that was like to watch this sort of hypnosis debate playing out while you were um, sitting there on trial for murder. Sure. Well, Tell you the truth, I wasn't really aware of hypnosis at that time. Like most people, I saw little movies every now and then that had some form of hypnosis in it. So I really didn't, I thought that they sort of put people in a trance and try to bring back their memories about certain things that they want them to remember. But I didn't really think that it was suggestive. I thought that the person can just actually recall on their own without no one actually putting ideas and you know uh, concepts and images in their minds. So for me, I was sort of confused because here was people uh, telling someone that they want to hypnotize them to remember placing me at a scene of crime where I know I was not at a scene of crime. It's like you know they was all in cahoots, so to speak, to put me in prison, and they was trying to find any reason by any means necessary to do that. And I thought this was another a way that they were just trying to ruin my life, trying to say something that I know I did not do in order to try to get me convicted. So they was using hypnosis as a form to do that. So what Sam alluded to um, in terms of the role that science, um, that sort of more positive spin on, um, on how science can play a role and, and, um, and how uh, the psychology research that had been developed in the interim between Fred's trial in 1980 and uh, his, uh, his, the new trial motion that I filed in 2016. In that time frame, a huge amount of research was done um, that touched on uh, many of the issues that had come out at Fred's trial. So one of those um, you know, that sort of most familiar to me as a lawyer was the sea change in how um, courts had essentially caught up with psychology researchers when it came to the factors that can influence um, and contribute to eyewitness error. Um, and so um, by the time um, I was looking at Fred's case, that was a relatively familiar um, territory. Um, you know, lawyers had at least for, for 10 years or so been, um, and, and in many instances longer than that, um, attempting to rely on the, the wisdom and the lessons that had come out of psych psychology research on essentially what are the things that cause people to make mistakes, what are the sort of um, issues with how memory is formed and how the, uh, the, the way that the process unfolds, the way that police detectives interact with witnesses, how can that influence um, and create uh, unreliable outcomes. Uh, but that was certainly one incredibly important piece of this because at the time of Fred's trial, um, you know, some of the research had been done, much of it had not yet been done, but certainly the courts were, were light years behind whatever research had occurred. Um, and in fact, the jury instructions um, very much sort of um, solidified all of that, uh, all of those um, things that were so wrong with how we understood things. And the second piece of it was, um, uh, you know, hypnosis, which, which, had, which had certainly gone through a dramatic sea change. And so um, in the course of litigating Fred's case, one of the things that I did was to find somebody who had, who had done a lot of research, um, not so much in the realm of, of how this was used in criminal cases because it had been abandoned long before, um, but who had a familiarity with the history of how hypnosis had come to be utilized in legitimate ways by psychologists um, and who could talk about the ways that it had been distorted here. Um, and then finally, one of the things that was sort of most um, interesting um, and different for me was that there, uh, there was a, the, the eyewitness, Neil Sweat, who, um, who eventually identified Fred, um, he had a very significant cognitive disability, which only came out at the retrial of Fred's co-defendant. And at the time of Fred's trial, it was very evident that this was a limited person. He, he had a really difficult time answering many of the questions that were posed to him during the trial. Um, and the prosecutor actually characterized him as being um, 
essentially like uh, the rain man of eyewitnesses. Um, that was sort of the, the idea that he was a, an eyewitness savant. Um, and so um, bringing to bear that actually uh, the fact that he had these cognitive limitations made him uniquely susceptible to police coercion. Um, that was an area where the discipline that had been used in the context of false confessions, um, where there has been a robust uh, research, psychology research on how, um, you know, how police coercion can, can impact um, suspects, that, that discipline we used to talk about eyewitness error. Um, so I want to um, now kind of, so the, those kind of three pillars ended up being a big part of what um, happened to break open the doors again for Fred's case. But, um, but in addition to that, there was this other whole piece of the story, um, which is what I want to turn to now, um, and I want to get Fred's help with. Um, and that was how psychology um, resulted in um, it, it, sort of how it affected his treatment in the system. Um, and I think of that as beginning uh, at, the, at the beginning. Um, you know, here is this barely 16-year-old boy um, charged with murder, and the court system had a choice whether to try him as an adult, and um, which, which carried a mandatory life without parole sentence. Um, so in essence, Massachusetts version of the death penalty. Um, you're sentenced to die in prison. Um, or had he been re retained in juvenile court, which could have happened, um, he would have been uh, out of custody by the age of 21. So you have this dramatic set of choices that, um, that, that he faced right at the beginning of the case. And, um, and I want to ask Fred to talk a little bit about the role that psychologists and sort of the early evaluations of him played in that decision. To, to transfer his case to adult court, to indict him, to try him um, as an adult, and send him to adult prison uh, for the rest of his life. Um, so Fred, I wanna, do you wanna just share some of your experiences of that process? Um, I say like early on, when I was in a juvenile phase of my case, trying to stay in juvenile court and trying to prevent myself from going to adult court. Um, so at that time, I was in middle school, well, at that time I was not, but I was supposed to be in middle school, and I, have, I, have, I had some issues in middle school, and I had a lot of psychiatrists that was sort of evaluating me, trying to understand why I was acting up the way I was at the time. But they became a part of my, um, my juvenile phase, so to speak. And they was telling the judge about my school activities, my behavior in school, my behavior in the community where I lived at, my uh, home life and stuff like that. So they would evaluate me based on my life at that time. And they really didn't even know me that well, but just based on some of the conversations that we was having, some of the answers I was giving them, and some of the people I guess they was talking to, they came up with their own diagnosis, so to speak. Uh, that was one factor. Another factor, those little cards that got all these ink blocks and stuff on them, I was putting through that test quite a, a bit, you know, and um, they was giving me these cards with ink blocks on it, asking me what they looked like to me. And here I was, a 16-year-old kid, looking at an image on a, a card, thinking, okay, I'm, I'm telling them what I think the image means. And based on some of the questions, uh, answers I gave them, they was actually diagnosing me, and I didn't really know that at that time. Because they didn't really make that part clear, that they was gonna have an input on whether I stay in juvenile court or whether I get convicted or turned, bound over to a dog court, as they said back then. But based on some of these answers that I gave them, just looking at a, a, a card, uh, one, I guess, psychologist, when she came up on the stand to give her testimony, based on the answers that I gave her, she said that uh, Mr. Clay, I think Mr. Clay is uh, insane. And when you're asking a 16-year-old kid or a 15-year-old kid or a 12-year-old kid, whatever it is, the age they, if you give them something on the paper and you ask them what they think that image means, they're going to tell you. But at the same time, their, their answer, not knowing that their answer can have an impact on their life. So based on my answer, I'm, I'm being honest, didn't think anything wrong with it. I know I'm not insane, but... Uh, she thought I was, but 
that had an impact on me getting bound over. And also the other people that he, you know, that testify in my juvenile facility uh, case, based on their testimony, the judge listened to them, told me personally in front of everybody else that at the age of 16 years old, based on what he heard about me, he thought that I was not capable of changing, or I wasn't, I'm not sure. But basically he was saying that I wasn't capable of changing. So telling, uh, having a judge tell a 16-year-old kid or a 13-year-old kid, whatever it is, that at that time in their life that they don't think that person can change. When I know, and a lot of people in here know, that we're constantly changing in our lives. I'm sure the age that you are right now, there's things that you might be changing daily about yourself. I know I'm, I'm continually changing. I'm 56 years old. But to telling a kid that at the age of 16 that he don't think he's able to change, so therefore he think that the adult system is better for me than the juvenile system. So basically taking me out of a, a, a juvenile facility and put me in, in the state prison, well actually giving me, bound me over to adult court to possibly go to state prison, that's the better result as opposed to keeping me in juvenile fac facilities. So those to me, I'm sure there's other factors, but those to me was the two factors that really played a key part of me being bound over to a dog court and eventually end up getting convicted at the age of 17 with a natural life sentence. So, you know, probably, although this is not, I think this is a little bit more in the field of, of um, uh, brain science, but one of the major um, developments that came into play in changing how the court system eventually, again, catching up with scientists, um, how the court system would look at juveniles is the field of, um, of adolescent brain development. Um, and one of the things that happened um, actually about a year after I learned about Fred's case was that a, um, a, a very significant U.S. Supreme Court decision came down, uh, Miller versus Alabama. And that decision um, reflected a series of, um, you know, a sort of a, a, a more modern understanding of how adolescent brains work and um, sort of a meshing of that, uh, that set of findings, the understanding that, ju that, that 16 year olds do not have fully developed brains, that, that evaluating the question of whether someone's capable of change or amenable to rehabilitation as a 16 year old um, cannot be done without that, taking that into account, sort of the fluidity and, uh, of the brain. Um, that came into, uh, into play in the law with the question of does it violate the, sixth, the Eighth Amendment ban on cruel and unusual punishment to sentence juveniles to life without the possibility of parole, without even taking that into account, without taking into account the elasticity and development of the brain. Um, and so that decision came down, and, and one of the things it did was it, it actually made Fred eligible um, in his 50s for a parole hearing. So at the same time that he and I were working together on challenging his, uh, his underlying conviction and demonstrating that he was in fact innocent, um, this, set, this sort of parallel track developed um, and Fred was represented by another lawyer, Jeff Harris, who, um, who, who successfully litigated that question and, and had a, a parole hearing um, where for the first time uh, ever uh, questions of um, who is this person um, who is sitting before the parole board um, were, were, you know, sort of came to light. Um, I think that that parole hearing, and I, I want to have turn it, turn it again to Fred, but I, for me, the, the parole hearing, the developments that led to him getting a chance at parole, and then the, um, the kind of um, related, because parole looks at, uh, parole looks at what happened, sort of what somebody's institutional experience was like. So um, the way that the uh, correctional system treated Fred for those many years when he, uh, under the law, would not ever have been eligible for parole. So the kind of limitations that were placed on his access to programs. Those strike me as two places where there is a tremendous amount of room for um, for research that can, you know, sort of, as I listen to the economists talking about um, efficiencies and, and ways of thinking about um, improving outcomes from different disciplines, um, that strikes me as ripe for real, um, for real research because um, the, the, and I'll, I want to have Fred um, have the last word on this, but I think that the, um, the way that our correctional system 
currently treats people. Um, talk about dehumanization, um, the, kind, the lack of access to programming, um, and developing research that demonstrates why it would be better for everyone if we approached correction, uh, you know, if we approached prisons in a different way, and if we approached um, what, wh how we treat people when they're incarcerated in a different way. So I want to turn to Fred to talk a, a bit about how, um, how those played out for him, both in terms of his experience in prison and also um, some of the challenges he's faced since getting out. Well, as far as some of the challenges I had in prison, I think maybe for quite a while, I was in early on in my stage, I was getting in trouble and breaking the rules and you know, prison stuff like that. But once I start slowing down and actually grow up, so to speak, I start to realize that I can, could not continue to do the time the way I was doing it. So once I start focusing on doing my time differently, that can be beneficial to me. I started to talk to other inmates that I saw there that was doing the right things. They was doing college degrees. You know, they had college degrees. They was doing all kinds of programs. So one of the programs that I was actually trying to get into in the beginning was called Second Thoughts. It was a program based on dealing with at-risk kids, you know, some you know, kids that was actually coming into the prison system at that time. Before they actually get to prison, they would bring a lot of 13, 14-year-old, 15, 6-year-old kids into some like Second Thoughts, and people can talk to them about coming, not coming to prison and share the experience, but based on my institutionalized behavior at that time, I was being denied to participate in second thoughts. Also, at that time, I was trying to get into anger management class, and I was trying to get into CRA program, which is uh, stand for Correctional Recovery Academy, um, but I was told because I was doing a natural life sentence and that CRA is program is sort of geared to people who have release dates, who got paroles, that a natural life a person is not able to join that program. They told me that I can, I can have my name placed on the list, but at the bottom of the list. So therefore, I would never actually get into the program. So some of the things that I was trying to address for myself, to try to change things about myself, I was being denied because of my time structure and because of my behavior. But the behavior part of my situation changed, but the uh, time structure didn't change. So I still was being denied programs because I was doing a natural life sentence. So I had to do other programs to try to make up for that. But even that was kind of challenging. It wasn't happening to me, that was happening to a lot of guys. Um, restorative justice and programs, stuff like that. Anger management, alternative to violence, a lot of people was being denied these programs that could be beneficial to them, that can change who they were. It changed me in different ways, but not those programs, but other programs. But I was being denied the access to change myself to do certain programs. And here I am doing a natural life sentence, and they tell me that I cannot join a program to help me deal with my anger. And I'm doing a natural life sentence. But the people that are actually doing smaller time, that got parole dates, release dates, they got access to these programs. So that was sort of made me angry. So I just started to search for other programs, growing together, emotional awareness, uh, able minds. I started dealing with trying to figure out other programs that could help me, similar to the ones I was being denied to get into, help me change things about myself, help me question my own thoughts, my own beliefs, help me think about the consequences to my action, help me figure out that I, I no longer need substance to deal with my life, help me get over the thought about here I am at that time, 2021, 20, doing a natural life sentence for a crime I didn't know I did not commit, and yet I'm trying, I'm, I'm being denied help from prison administration that I thought I can benefit from. So people's opinions about who is eligible for programs, who is not eligible for programs is, I mean, that's still happening to some degree today, but at that time, it just made me even more angry. Okay, so I think, I think we might leave it for questions. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> 
couple of questions that have come in through the app. So if you want to send more, please do. Um, to uh, Mr. Clay, what do you think psychologists should know and should try to understand about the court system and incarceration and the transition to um, everyday society in terms of how it can affect people? Well, especially when it comes to reentry programs, people who come out of prison or suffer from some form of PTSD. Uh, there's a lot of institutionalized behaviors that I'm slowly getting rid of, but now that I'm aware of it, I'm getting rid of it, but in the beginning, there's a lot of issues with that, there's a lot of challenges with that. People are afraid to be in crowds. So um, not only that, just when you do something for three days straight or a week straight, it becomes a habit. So and for, imagine doing something for 38 years straight. It becomes a habit. So for me personally, I need for people to understand that technology, because I was 16 years old when I got arrested. I was 17 years old when I got convicted. Technology for me now is a really big challenge. And maybe you have patience with technology, but I don't. But because I'm trying to make up for so much lost time and technology is the way of life now. So for me to try to get involved with that now and learn that stuff now is very challenging for me. So people need to try to understand that you can't expect people to, especially me, when I got out of prison, people was texting me, emailing me, and they was mad that I wasn't responding quickly. But I wasn't raised with this stuff. The stuff was just introduced to me. I'm still trying to figure some of that out, and they don't understand that. So try to get better understanding of that. Also, in, in prison, when you're dealing with people who there's all kind of individual in prison, everybody got their own personalities, everybody got their own challenges. But when you um, categorize them, put them in a category, make your diagnosis of them, you're having a profound effect on their lives, whether you, you know it or not. Your opinions, like I didn't know the people that was evaluating me back then, I didn't know how much impact they was gonna have in my life. And you need to think about that. If you go work in the Department of Corrections and you pull up people's files and stuff, you, you really don't know these people. You see their names, their, their car number, you might have a little history about them, but your diagnosis, your opinions, your thoughts about them matters. And I, need to, I want people to think, I know people think that people in prison are there because they committed crimes. Not everybody in prison is guilty. I'm a true testament of that. So there's a story behind that file that you're looking at. There's a life behind that file. And I need people to understand, you need to start looking at people as human beings and not as a statistic. We have time for one more short question um, to uh, Lisa, Sam, and Fred. How can we as psychologists get involved earlier in these processes so that people like Mr. Clay don't have to wait 38 years before getting exonerated? I'll start. Um, I mean, I think one, uh, one, one thought I had is actually, as I was listening to the first part of this symposium, is that <clears throat> I think the, um, the more uh, that psychologists and lawyers can start talking to each other and anticipating um, some of the ways that these issues are playing out, the better. Um, so I, I think that, you know, for, for me anyway, as, a, as an advocate, um, you know, taking the time to get to know how uh, the discipline of psychology might be brought to bear on some of these um, areas that Sam alluded to at the beginning um, that haven't yet been litigated. Um, you know, thinking about uh, uh, opportunities to partner uh, with people who aren't traditionally in a research field. Uh, I think that there's a lot of ways that, um, that those partnerships have been effective in shaping uh, the legal system, certainly in the realm of eyewitness error. That's one where there's been a lot of success. Um, and I don't know if that's because some of the psychology researchers who've, who were pioneers in that field also had JDs, but I think now there's so much more um, you know, crossover that um, that 
simply having these conversations and think, you know, sort of hearing, uh, inviting lawyers who are litigating these cases to come and speak, and then seeing what ideas that brings about, um, knowing what the current challenges are in the criminal legal system, and um, and sort of having open discussions about how research might be brought to bear on that. I think that. Um, that gives me a lot of hope um, for, for possibilities to, to not have um, the kind of unconscionable delay that happened in, in Fred's case repeat itself. So on that note, thank you all for coming and we'll be here for a couple more minutes uh, if you have any additional questions. And one more round of applause for all of our speakers. Please. <laughs>